the complex community that I love. So, um, May 1993, uh, my family and I, my mothers and my mother, not mothers, mother, uh, and three sisters, we get off this airplane and we are greeted by strangers. Strangers who overnight become family. I'll never forget it. It was a bright day. You walk out, the airport lights were uh, extremely uh, hot, it felt like. Greeted by all these, truthfully, white folks. We're in Portland. And they've got balloons and they've got flowers and they welcome us. And strangers become family. And a community becomes home. We had just gone through this war. We're originally from Liberia, West Africa, a country that was found by freed and slave blacks. They go back shortly after emancipation, and they say, you know, let's, let's start anew. Well, the complicated part about it is these people end up enslaving the indigenous people, right? The complexity of that. Well, I'm a direct descendant of one of those people who enslaved the indigenous people. I'm also a direct descendant of some of the indigenous people. So years later, we get on this plane and we come to this country, and this community becomes our home. And this community becomes a place where we not only grow, but we become something new. And it welcomes us. So we're living in interesting times. And so much around us is essentially telling us we're either or. You know, it tells guys like me, I'm a black man, and because I'm a black man, there are all of these things that come with it. It tells some other folk, you know, you're, you're lesbian, you're transgender, whatever you are. And over the last couple months, as I've wrestled, like I'm sure most of you are wrestling, I've been trying to figure out, so what, is, what does this mean? And who are we as a people? And who am I? And what's my role in all of this? And I've come to a conclusion that it's about intersectionality, right? So I am a black man, but I'm a father. I'm a son. I'm a husband. But most importantly, I'm a person. I'm a person with complexity and nuance. And what happens oftentimes, and what whiteness and sort of this country has done to us is it, it minimizes the complexity of that. So one of my favorite authors is James Baldwin. And Baldwin famously says that we live in a complex nation that often tries to simplify itself, that often tries to make us the other. And as a black man, I'm often made the other. I'm often try, they try to, but I don't fall into this trap anymore. They try to make me become something. They try to label me, right? They, they over-sexualize, they talk about things. There, there are these innuendos, right? Because we live in a Portland, you know, a nice community. But I've reached this point where when I embrace intersectionality, I realize something. I realize that being good as a person has less to do with the forces around me, but it has more to do with the spirits of those who have come before me. About a year ago, I lost someone who was really important to me, my grandmother. And my grandmother taught me something that's absolutely profound. And that is, she taught me to believe in people. She taught me hope. She, you know, I'll never forget, we're going through the war in Liberia, and once we were at her house, and what would happen is the rebels would go to houses and they would take you out, and they would go in and either rape folks or they kill you. And so this commotion, this interplay occurs where my mother and my grandmother, so they're banging at the door, we're in the house, and her house is a square. And we're in the middle of this square, and they're banging at the door, and they're saying, come out, and they're using profanity. And my mother says, we've got to go out, because what would happen is if you don't go out, they set the house on fire. And my grandmother says, no, we should stay in. So finally, my mother grabs us by the hand, and, and as we're walking, a bullet is shot. And what's crazy is, so I went back a year ago, and I looked, and the bullet hole is still there. So we finally, we get out. 
and we're lined up, and they're going to kill us. And my mother looks at us, and she says, pray. And we begin to pray. And the gun that was, that was shot moments ago, he cocks it. And he pulls the trigger, and that gun was jammed. Hope. So that person who went through that experience is now in this community. That person who is now 32 years old, a father of two, a husband, runs an organization doing amazing things in the world, is a dreamer. A dreamer who believes in this community's potential to be great. A dreamer who believes in this community's potential to rise to this moment and say something new. So why do I believe in this? So we come to this country and we're embraced. We're embraced by a church community that helped ground me in faith. But we're also embraced in a school community. So I went to Whitaker Middle School. Uh, when Whitaker existed, before, you know, displacements happened and we were promised a new building, we never got the building. I'm, a little, I'm still a little upset about it, if you can't tell. <laughs> but at Whitaker, I learned something. At Whitaker, I learned community. I learned community. At Whitaker, I was introduced to people who didn't have the family dynamics that I had, but yet they cared for me. And to this day, they're still some of my closest friends. At Whitaker, I learned not only in the flaws of our public policy, but I also learned about the dimensions of, human, of humanity and how people with nothing can make something and they can dream anew. I learned about the complexity of this community, but I also learned about hope. So we're living in weird times. And it seems like so much around us is moving, like literally sometimes. And it feels like in these times, we're being questioned to be different or be new. Sometimes, truthfully, it feels like we're going back. But there's hope. So if you know anything about me, you know, there was a time in my life when I wanted to go into the ministry. Uh, that was, that was short-lived. <laughs> There's an old song that says, my hope was built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and righteousness. My hope, I won't sing, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and righteousness. So we're in this moment, we're in this time, and we're all searching. We're all looking. So here's my three things. Embrace complexity. Don't allow the world to minimize you to a caricature or an, a, a singular being. Embrace your wholeness. Be dynamic. Recognize intersectionality. So a couple of nights ago, my wife and I are sitting there and we're talking about how do you end racism, right? Like, these are things that I talk about late at night. <laughs> Hence why I don't get invited back to a lot of parties, you know? <laughs> and she says something extremely profound that has stuck with me. She says, if you want to end racism, figure out how to change white women. Never thought about that. So I ask her why. She says, well, think about it. Who raises children overwhelmingly? Mothers. Think about the feminism movement. When women in this country, particularly white women, said they were going to get their rights, they talked to their husbands, talked to their fathers, and what happened? Eventually, they got a lot. Now, we got to do that. We, we, we've learned from yesterday that the fight's not over. But something did happen. And the third and the last thing, let's always remember, 
that we've seen darker days. And moments don't define us. We define moments. One of my favorite uh, quotes is by a guy by the name of Benjamin Elijah Mays. Dr. Mays was the president of Morehouse College. And he once said, I have just a minute, only 60 seconds in it. Forced upon me, can't refuse it. Didn't seek it, didn't choose it, but it's up to me to use it. I must suffer if I lose it. Give an account if I abuse it. Just a tiny minute, but an eternity is in it. We're in these times for a reason. The fight's not over, but here's what we have to do. We have to fight. And here's the more important part. We have to fight together. Thank you all.